This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. At 7 p.m. on the night of September 7, 1934, as the SS Morrow Castle sailed north from Havana to New York, the ship's doctor was summoned to Captain Robert Renison Wilmot's cabin. The ordinarily charismatic Captain Wilmot complained of stomach issues throughout the voyage, and that night he had dinner alone in his cabin. Not long after, the 55-year-old captain was found dead in his bathroom. Only a few hours later, the SS Morrow Castle would be consumed by flames in one of the worst maritime fires in history, a disaster still steeped in mystery to this day. In 1841, James Otis Ward established a freight consignment company in New York City known as the Ward Line. By 1881, the company was incorporated under the name New York and Cuba Mail Steamship Company, and would continue to carry passengers, cargo, and mail to Cuba through the turn of the century. But by the 1920s, the company found itself teetering on the edge of bankruptcy due to its aging fleet and decades of mismanagement until the Merchant Marine Act of 1928 provided subsidies that would help revive the company. At the time, despite ongoing political unrest, Cuba was a popular destination for American tourists, and the Ward Line was eager to cash in with a pair of modern new passenger liners. Each ship would cost $5.5 million to build, with the U.S. government covering two-thirds of the costs with low-interest loans that would be paid off over a 20-year period. These funds would help shield the company from the effects of the Great Depression. The first of these two ships was the SS Moro Castle, named after the stone fortress that guards the port of Havana. The name was taken from a previous Wardline vessel that was launched in 1900 and left service in 1924. Her keel was laid down in January 1929 at the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company in Virginia. The new Morro Castle was designed by Theodore Ferris, who designed over 1,800 private, commercial, and military vessels over the course of his career. He was best known for his World War I troop and cargo ship designs. While the Morrow Castle would go on to prove famously unsafe, Ferris integrated several modern safety features into her design. The Titanic disaster was still a very fresh memory at the time, and the Morrow Castle was considered a modern and well-equipped liner. She had 12 lifeboats capable of carrying 2,000 people. There were safety cards in the wall in every cabin and in hallways throughout the ship, and she was partitioned with steel bulkheads and fire doors that could be closed in an emergency. She was also equipped with a Lyle gun that could be used to establish a line to get off the ship. She had a fire detection system with sensors installed in every passenger cabin as well as crew quarters, offices, and on the bridge. She was also equipped with 42 water hydrants, though no more than six could be used at the same time. Her captain, Robert Renison Wilmot, would be on hand throughout her construction to acquaint himself with the ship's new technological advancements. The new liner would come in at 11,520 tons with a length of 508 feet and a beam of 70 feet. She was powered by steam turboelectric engines that drove twin screws at 14,000 shaft horsepower, achieving a speed of 20 knots. She was also equipped with a modern bulbous bow and could carry 489 passengers and a crew of 240. But the feature that would really set Morrow Castle apart were her luxurious interiors intended to draw in affluent tourists. Nearly every surface of her public rooms and passenger cabins was covered in fine woodwork and appointed with fine furnishings and accents. The Morrow Castle was launched on March 5, 1930. She was christened by Ruth Eleanor Mooney, daughter of Frank D. Mooney, who was president of the Ward Line at the time. Her sister ship, the Oriente, 
was launched just a few months later. The Morrow Castle's maiden voyage began on August 23, 1930. She largely lived up to expectations, proving popular passengers and completing her voyages safely and largely on schedule, which was important to maintain her lucrative U.S. mail contract. Despite the Great Depression, she maintained steady passenger numbers due in large part to her reasonable rates and the escape she offered from both prohibition and the dreary economic conditions in the States. She was regarded as a fun, affordable, and luxurious escape. But as she maintained her feverish schedule, mismanagement and tense labor relations boiled under the surface, slowly turning the Morrow Castle into a gilded death trap. Now I'd like to take a second to thank this video sponsor, CuriosityStream. So, I have a confession to make. I'm absolutely addicted to documentaries and educational videos, and I have a sneaking suspicion that if you're a fan of my channel, you might feel the same way. That's why I'm excited to share CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a streaming service that brings you award-winning exclusives and originals. They offer thousands of entertaining movies and TV shows on topics like history, nature, technology, and more with 35 curated collections hand-picked by their experts. It's like Netflix if it was made exclusively for people who love to learn about the world around them. And you can stream from any device, making it easy to watch at home or on the go. One of my recent favorites is Apocalypse World War I, a series that takes a deep dive into the major events of the conflict with incredible rare footage. I'm fascinated by the ways in which history shapes the world we live in, and this series is a fantastic way to learn more. Use code BIGOLDBOATS at checkout, or follow the link in the description to get CuriosityStream for an entire year for just $14.99 or 25% off an annual plan. That's an incredible deal. If you love the documentaries on my channel, you'll love what you find on CuriosityStream. I hope that you'll support them and me by checking them out in the link below. Alright, back to the Moral Castle. Moro Castle left Havana for her 174th voyage on September 5, 1934. The voyage started off routine, with fair weather, but by the evening of the 7th, as she sailed up the coast of New Jersey, conditions took a turn as signs of a developing nor'easter became apparent with increasing winds and intermittent rain. Like most all of her voyages, she was captained by Robert Renison Wilmot. Captain Wilmot was attached to the Moro Castle long before her first designs were put to paper. The experienced English captain served with the Ward Line for 30 years, with the first 13 years of his time at the company spent serving on the previous Morrow Castle. He was a charming host and excelled at the social aspects of his job. Americans love an English accent. Passengers apparently clamored for a seat at his table for the chance to hear his many stories and his encyclopedic knowledge of the ship. He was so popular that passengers would specifically seek out his voyages when booking. He famously told passengers that his name was synonymous with Morrow Castle and vice versa. This would prove ominously true. Captain Wilmot's popularity, however, did not seem to extend to his crew. While passengers enjoyed a relatively carefree escape and a reasonable standard of luxury, conditions for Wardland crew were less than ideal. There were almost constant disputes among employees over the poor living conditions on the liner, substandard food, low pay, and language barriers. These poor conditions led to a very high level of turnover and accusations of drug running, communist plots among disgruntled crew members, illegal immigration rings, and other questionable activities that probably weren't all that legal. Still, despite unsavory rumors and simmering unrest among crew, passengers were largely unaware. On this particular voyage, Captain Wilmot was not nearly as social as he normally was. Issues with the crew were mounting, and the captain even confided with some of his officers that he suspected someone on board was trying to kill him and destroy the ship. But more on that spicy little detail later. The 55-year-old captain, who seemed to be in excellent health, spent most of the voyage in his cabin with stomach issues. On the night of September 7th, he had a dinner of steak and vegetables alone in his cabin, surely disappointing passengers eager to dine with his English accent. Equally disappointed were the captain's bowels, as he telephoned requesting an enema be brought to his cabin. Not long after, Chief Engineer Aben Abbott attempted to contact the captain to alert him to an issue with one of the boilers. After receiving no response, a crew member was sent to summon the captain. He found Captain Wilmot dead in his bathroom just before 7pm. The ship's doctor, Dr. DeWitt Van Zyl, was summoned to the cabin. 
he attributed the death to acute indigestion, though it was later suspected to be a heart attack. Command of the ship was transferred to Chief Officer William Warms. Warms was a relatively inexperienced officer who was not well liked by the crew, though the crew seemed to hate pretty much everyone in charge. While it seems no one was eager to see Warms take command, head purser Robert Tolman telegraphed the ward line's president to confirm the captain's death and Warms would assume the position of acting captain. The night's farewell party was canceled out of respect and by midnight, the confusion seemed to settle. With the festivities canceled and the ship sailing into foul weather, most of the passengers went to bed early, thinking they'd wake up in New York Harbor the next morning. At approximately 2.45 a.m. Cuba time on September 8th, while the Morro Castle was eight nautical miles off Long Beach Island, a passenger alerted steward Daniel Campbell that they smelled smoke. Campbell followed the smell to a locker in the first-class riding room on B-deck, where he found a small but abnormally intense fire raging. He attempted to put it out himself, but was unable to, and he ran to get help, reporting it to night watchman Arthur Pender. Pender made the fatal decision to not immediately sound a general alarm, thinking that the small fire could be easily contained. He was wrong, and the fire quickly erupted in size and severity. This was only the first in a series of bad and confusing decisions made that night. The fire spread rapidly, fully engulfing most of the ship in just a few minutes. By around 3.10 a.m., the fire burned through the ship's main electrical cables, plunging the ship into darkness before many passengers were even awake. Acting Captain Warms at first wanted to beach the ship on the nearby coast, but he gave up when he realized that the ship needed to be abandoned. He left the ship limping into a direct headwind that flowed through the ship's many openings and fanned the flames. They managed to send only one SOS signal by radio at 3.24 a.m. via auxiliary battery power. The SOS was not received by the Coast Guard, but was relayed to them by a commercial radio station in the area. By 3.40 a.m., crews were forced to abandon the bridge due to the advancing fire. The fire was most intense at the center of the ship, which sent most of the crew to her bow and most of the passengers to the stern, where the winds drove the smoke and flames. Finally, by around 4 a.m., passengers and crew began abandoning the ship. Only six of her 12 lifeboats were launched. While they had a combined capacity of 408, they carried only 85 people, most of which were crew members, including Chief Engineer Abbott. The passengers of the Moro Castle were largely left on their own to fight for survival, though some crew remained trying in vain to fight the inferno or help passengers escape. Bob Smith, the ship's cruise director, worked heroically to get passengers out of their cabins. He directed around 125 people to safer spaces on sea deck and continued to keep people calm and away from the smoke and fire as long as he could. His work that night undoubtedly saved many lives, but as the flames overtook the ship, Passengers had no choice but to jump into the churning sea, where those that would survive waited hours for rescue. A week-long honeymoon on board the Moro Castle was a trip of a lifetime for Marjorie Janini and her new husband, Dr. Paul Janini. And until the night of the 7th, the voyage lived up to their expectations. Marjorie particularly loved dancing on deck every night. On the night of the fire, Marjorie stirred from a deep sleep and looked up through her cabin's porthole to see flames reflected in the glass. Still groggy and not quite believing what she saw, she fell back asleep for a few moments before she and Paul finally woke up and realized the severity of the situation. They put wet towels over their faces and put on their life preservers. When they exited their cabin, they found the hallway dark and engulfed in smoke. The Janinis ran up and down the hallway, banging on doors to wake up fellow passengers. After rousing around 16 people, the small group made their way to A-deck in an attempt to reach the lifeboats, but they found the deck abandoned and completely engulfed in flames. They saw one officer attempting to use a fire hydrant, but there was no water pressure. The group was then guided to another deck by cruise director Bob Smith. Soon the smoke was so thick that the group, forced to the stern of the ship, had no choice but to jump. Marjorie wasn't afraid of the water and jumped first, and soon reunited with Paul in the water. The propellers were still turning, and Marjorie thought this probably caused the deaths of several people that night. 
For the rest of her life, she was haunted by the sight of a large man with a life ring around his waist, beating away struggling passengers who struggled to find something to hold on to. She would later identify the man as Chief Radio Officer George Rogers. In the stormy seas, the Janinis became separated from their group. After drifting in the darkness, they saw the flash of the Seagirt lighthouse in the distance and swam toward the light, pausing frequently to catch their breath. Paul was a heavy smoker and struggled more than Marjorie. When they paused, he would rest his head on her chest. The couple finally struggled to shore through the heavy surf at daylight, exhausted but with only minor injuries caused by the life preservers when they jumped from the ship. Without any safety drill, passengers were not aware of the injuries the life-saving equipment could potentially cause. Marjorie and Paul Giannini estimated they swam and drifted some 12 miles to shore, aided by the winds of the nor'easter that pushed them to the beach and saved their lives. Eighteen-year-old Franz Debesch was about to start his senior year at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx in New York City. The champion swimmer and track star was returning home from vacation in Cuba. He shared a cabin with 19-year-old Joseph Hidalgo, a student at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. At around 3 a.m., Joseph and Franz were awoken by the sounds of running outside their cabin door. They looked out their porthole and saw the sky looked red. Then, someone banged on their door, telling them to dress and put on their life preservers because the ship was on fire. On deck, Joseph and Franz met up with 17-year-old Rosario Camacho, a friend they met earlier on the voyage. When the boys saw that she wasn't wearing a life preserver, they both began to remove theirs. But Franz stopped Joseph and said, don't be ridiculous, you know I'm the better swimmer, and he gave his life preserver to Rosario. As they moved aft, smoke began to overtake the passengers on deck creating a panic and people began to jump. Joseph became separated from the group, but he saw Franz and Rosario jump from the deck above holding hands. He soon followed, hoping to join his friends in the water. Joseph landed near the ship's propellers and swam toward a group clinging to pieces of wood. He spent seven hours in the water and said that his eyes were starting to close when he thought he saw a boat approaching. He was picked up by the freighter City of Savannah and was rescued. He did not remember being taken aboard the ship. When Rosario landed in the water, she was stunned by the impact and lost consciousness for a few moments until she found herself tangled in some rope. She was able to read the words Moro Castle on the burning hole above her. Eventually, she was rescued by the Andrea F. Luckenbach. It's believed that she survived thanks in large part to her life preserver, which kept her head above water until she regained consciousness. During their jump from the ship, she was separated from Franz. The 18-year-old swimming champion was one of the 40 victims whose body was never recovered. Official rescue efforts were slow to respond to the unfolding tragedy. The cargo ship SS Andrea F. Luckenbach was the first to arrive on the scene at approximately 4.15 a.m. By this point, most of the Moro Castle's passengers and crew had already been forced into the sea. At the same time, several people in coastal towns all along the shore saw the burning ship and began calling the Coast Guard, as well as local police and fire stations. Various alarms and sirens, as well as word of mouth, drew large crowds of people to the beaches, at 5 a.m., the next rescue ship, the SS Monarca Bermuda, arrived on the scene, followed by the SS City of Savannah at around 5.15. The three merchant ships, along with a local fishing boat, the Paramount, would save the majority of the surviving passengers and crew, as well as small craft launched from the beach. The 60-foot Paramount, captained by John Bogan and his sons John Jr. and Jim, rescued 67 people alone. The United States Coast Guard was slower to respond to the situation due to the storm and issues recalling crew. The Coast Guard cutters Cahoon and Tampa both arrived on the scene a bit before 8 a.m., but largely remained too far away from the burning wreck to rescue anyone still in the water. The Coast Guard's aerial station at Cape May failed to send a float plane to the area until very late when local radio stations began reporting bodies washing ashore. The governor of New Jersey, Harry Moore, even contributed to the rescue by flying his plane over the scene 
helping find survivors in the water and dropping markers to help rescue boats pick them up. Ambulance crews, police, and fire departments assembled at Spring Lake and Seagirt and began helping local lifeguards pull survivors from the surf, who began to reach shore by around 9 a.m. Lifeguards in Seagirt attempted to launch a lifeboat from the shore to better reach people in the water, but the heavy surf prevented them. Instead, they swam into the surf on their own to help rescue people. Lifeguard Tom Black later recalled, Throughout the day, we swam out to where the surf broke and pulled in 15 people, many of whom were near death. We had to get to them before they were thrown with force on the beach, which would have killed them in their weakened condition. In some cases, though, we were too late. Acting Captain Warms, along with a few other officers, remained on board until around 1 p.m. Shortly after, a line was established by Coast Guard Cutter Tampa to tow the still-burning hull to New York, but almost immediately, the heavy surf snapped the line, sending the Morrow Castle adrift. Winds pushed her to the beach at Asbury Park, where she nearly collided with the convention hall. Her burned-out wreck would remain dug into the sand for six months. The wreck was eventually towed to Baltimore on March 29, 1935, where she was finally scrapped. Out of the 549 people on board the Morrow Castle that night, 137 lost their lives. The Morrow Castle disaster was a media sensation even before the last survivors were rescued from the water, leading to intense speculation over what caused the fire. The FBI, the New York District Attorney, the Commerce Department, and the United States Congress all launched investigations into the tragedy. While the exact cause of the blaze has never been officially confirmed, several factors were identified that exacerbated the disaster and contributed to the heavy loss of life. On the surface, the Morrow Castle appeared to be a modern liner equipped with the latest safety features, but the disaster would reveal serious flaws in her design and safety procedures. While she was equipped with fireproof bulkheads and fire doors, critically, there was a 6-inch open space between the wood ceilings and the steel bulkheads, allowing fire to quickly spread from room to room. The highly flammable veneered wood surfaces and paneling also contributed to the speed of the blaze. And while the ship was equipped with fire sensors, there were none in her public spaces, including the writing room where the fire originated. There were fire alarms throughout the ship, but they reportedly produced only a muffled sound that most passengers couldn't even hear. And to further hinder attempts by the crew to put out the blaze, out of her 42 fire hydrants, several were covered when a passenger tripped over one and sued the ward line on a previous voyage. To make matters worse, only six could be used at a time, so when crews began using them all over the ship, the water pressure dropped to almost nothing. On top of the many design flaws, crew operations further contributed to the disaster. It was common practice to almost constantly paint to keep the ship looking new. The thick layers of paint made many surfaces even more flammable. The crew previously disabled the automatic trip lines on the ship's fire doors, which were designed to close when temperatures reached a certain point, and on the night of the fire they failed to manually close them. While as previously mentioned, some crew members behaved heroically that night, Overall, the crew's actions were widely condemned by investigators, the media, and the general public. Safety drills were only conducted among the crew and didn't include passengers. On the night of the fire, many crew members neglected their safety training and largely left passengers on their own. And in the critical early moments after the fire was detected, crew wasted valuable time continuing to operate as normal before raising any alarm. In fact, the reason only one SOS was ever sent was because the acting captain neglected to give the radio operators a definitive order until well into the disaster. But by far the most damning evidence of malpractice among the crew was the six lifeboats successfully launched from the ship that carried almost entirely crew and failed to remain near the ship to help rescue people in the water. In the end, the crew's inadequacies appear in the survival rates, with 30% of passengers perishing in the disaster compared with only 18% of the crew members. But what actually caused the fire in the first place? Without a definitive cause determined in the official investigations, several theories have emerged over the years. Some speculate that the fire could have been caused by poorly maintained funnel uptakes that became overheated and ignited the paint, Lyle gun ammunition, and other flammable materials stored in the writing room storage locker. Other theories posit that the fire was sparked by faulty electric wires. With the track record of poor maintenance and a poorly trained crew, it's not hard to imagine these scenarios. But the potential cause that gets the most attention is arson, and that's for good reason. 
As previously mentioned, the relationship between the crew and the officers were tense to say the least. There was a particularly tense conflict with the ship's second radio operator, George Alagna, who was suspected of being a radical for his efforts to organize a strike to demand better labor conditions. Captain Wilmot, becoming increasingly suspicious, confided with some of his officers that he thought someone in the crew was out to murder him and destroy the ship, which is uh, pretty bold considering the topic of this video. But let's talk about Chief Radio Officer George Rogers, one of the men Captain Wilmot supposedly confided in. Early after the disaster, Rogers was seen as a hero. He was eager to give interviews and often painted his actions that night as courageous, though other witnesses paint a less flattering picture. In fact, most of the officers and crew found Rogers to be standoffish and quick to anger before the disaster. But the really damning aspects of Rogers' character began to come out in later years. In 1936, he secured a job at the Bayonne Police Department as an assistant to a man named Vincent Doyle. Doyle was interested in Rogers' experience of the Morro Castle disaster, but quickly grew suspicious and over time began asking increasingly probing questions. In 1938, Rogers delivered an unsigned package containing a fish tank heater to Doyle, asking him to repair it. When Doyle plugged in the heater, it exploded. Doyle survived but was severely injured. Rogers was convicted of attempted murder and he was sent to prison, but this incident wasn't the only one. Before working for the Ward Line, in 1929 when Rogers was employed at the Wireless Eager Company in New York, a fire broke out. He was suspected of arson, but there was not enough evidence to prove anything. After going to jail for bombing his employer in 1938, Rogers was released early in 1942 to serve in the Navy, but they took one look at his criminal record and said, hell no. By 1952, he was experiencing significant financial difficulties and a friend named William Hummel gave him a loan. But after Hummel began pressuring him to pay the loan back the next year, he and his daughter were found bludgeoned to death in their home. Rogers was found guilty of two counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison, where he died a few years later. It's hard not to listen to Rogers' background and his subsequent actions and not conclude that he was responsible for the fire on board the Moro Castle and the death of Captain Wilmot. And to complicate matters, Captain Wilmot's body was never able to be properly autopsied, so no definitive cause of death could ever be determined. But in the end, there's no concrete evidence that George Rogers, or anyone else for that matter, was responsible for the events of that evening. Captain Wilmot was widely reported to be under a great deal of stress leading up to his death, and the investigation seemed satisfied that he suffered a heart attack that night. In the end, unless something comes out that proves otherwise, the cause of the disaster will remain a mystery. But no matter what caused the fire, serious design flaws and the crew's failure to react properly cost many lives that night. Acting Captain William Warms, Chief Engineer Eben Abbott, and Ward Line Vice President Henry Cabode were all convicted of various crimes, including willful negligence, and all three served jail time. Though Warms and Abbott's sentences were overruled on appeal, with the judge saying that Warms, quote, maintained the best tradition of the sea by staying on his ship until the bridge burned under him and no one else was aboard. If there is any silver lining to this story, it's that the horrific events of that night led to significant changes in how passenger ships are designed and the safety measures all ships now have to maintain. Still, those changes came too late for the people who lost their lives that night. Most of them saved up to afford a brief escape from the hard times at home and never imagined what was about to happen to them. Thank you so much for watching. What do you think happened that night? Was it arson or just an accident? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want to do me a solid, go ahead and hit that like button and, you know, maybe subscribe. I want to once again thank Curiosity Stream. Help out this channel by checking them out in the link below. All right, crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.